Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's Wednesday night, and we are here uh, for our Pine Drive Baptist Church uh, prayer meeting uh, via the Zoom. And, and uh, I'm really uh, pleased with the number that are here tonight, and, and I know that we may have some others join us a little bit later. But it's just good. I, I say this every Wednesday because it is true. It's good to be together as uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ here at Pine Drive and uh, just a fellowship and then uh, hear a message hopefully from God and then uh, uh, come before the Lord with our prayers and our concerns and our praises and the things that are our hearts and, and what a what an honor what a privilege that is and uh, even as I'm saying that it, it, when you really put things in in perspective um to show how blessed we really are. Just think of the number of people in the world that would give anything to be able to per be participating in this tonight, if nothing more than, than uh, just to listen in. So, so we're blessed and God's gonna bless us again tonight because he's here, his presence. And, uh, and, and one of the most amazing things of all, he's gonna let us pray and talk to him. So I'm gonna look at Jeremiah chapter 20 um, for a message tonight. And uh, before we do that, I want to lead us in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord, our Heavenly Father God, we, we are so blessed, so privileged. We're so blessed that, that so often, too often, frequently, we take these blessings for granted. And we just live our life and, and, and you do things for us and with us and through us and in us. And, and, and Lord, we, we, we don't realize the, the love that, that you are pouring down upon us. And no matter what our situation or circumstance may be. And so, Father, we just praise you for giving us Jesus Christ, for salvation that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt with certainty that when, whenever you bring us home or whenever you come for your people, your church, that we'll be there with you and for all eternity and, and our loved ones who have preceded us there to be with you tonight, Lord, and, and for all eternity. So Father, I just uh, thank you for each person that's here. I pray, God, that you would fill us all with the power of the Holy Spirit to sharpen our ears, to sharpen our our, our our eyes to uh, listen for that word that you may have for us tonight, Lord, because we all, maybe not tonight, but from time to time, Lord, and in fact, more frequently, it appears, uh, at least uh, to me, that, that we need encouragement, Lord, and, and that's what we seek. We, we seek to glorify you. We seek to receive from you, Father God. We seek to lay our concerns and our praises, uh, at the throne of grace, not only for ourselves, Lord, but for those that we're going to see in our prayer list tonight and those who are in our heart. So, Father, just be with us. Fill us all for just this hour. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're going to take a look, <clears throat> excuse me, at Jeremiah chapter 20. And uh, I want to talk to you a message tonight about rising above discouragement, rising above discouragement. So many things that, uh, uh, that you know and I know that, that, that if, we're, uh, uh, if we allow Satan uh, to bring discouragement into our lives, uh, that, that we so easily fall for it. And, and sometimes we recognize it and we get out of it very, very quickly by turning to the Lord. And other times, that discouragement, sometimes it may be so strong that it just knocks us down and, and, uh, and, and we don't feel like, you know, we can become undiscouraged, if you will. So that's what I want to talk to us tonight about rising above discouragement. And I want to use the, uh, the, the Old Testament book, Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah, as you know, was, was the weeping pro uh, prophet, called the weeping prophet. And he had reasons. If you go through the book of Jeremiah, the letter that he wrote, you can, you can understand why he was known and called the weeping prophet. You know, the Super Bowl is Sunday. And uh, I know there's all over the world, there's going to be people that are listening in and, and, and watching. Um, and I was thinking about uh, uh, the, the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, 
this year as they were in the playoffs and they had a kicker by the name of Brett Maher. And Brett Maher was, now he's a professional kicker, obviously, because he's kicking for the, for the Dallas Cowboys. And, and uh, I mean, his field goal percentage was in the 80s or 90% throughout the year from, from distances, 50 yards, or in, in some cases, even more. Uh, he'd make three-point field goal. Well, in this playoff game against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the, Tom Brady's outfit, he missed four extra points. Extra points is what you kick in high school. I mean, you learn high school kickers kick extra points. Most of them very, very easy. But he, as a professional football player, missed four uh, points that, that didn't cost him the game, but it could have. And so I was thinking about a story that happened back in 2015, a Minnesota kicker, uh, another field goal kicker for the Minnesota Vikings uh, was in, in, in a playoff game and, uh, and his name was Blair Walsh. Uh, and he made a high of that year, he made a high, the highest number of field goals in the National Football League. He kicked 34 field goals that year. And, and before the, the Vikings playoff game against the Seattle Seahawks, he converted 33 of 34 of these extra point kicks and, and, and 33 or 34 points uh, inside the 30 yard line. And so when the Vikings were down 10 to nine, in other words, his team was losing 10 to nine, they only had 22 seconds left. And Walsh lined up with his simple, sure shot, 25-yard field goal. And guess what? It, he missed it. His kick sailed wide to the, uh, to, to the right. And the Viking, the Viking season came crashing down. Uh, unlike Maher's Dallas, they, uh, Dallas Cowboys, they lived to fight another week. But in this case, the Viking season ended in the midst of a social media storm, as you can imagine. Uh, it was directed against Walsh, and, and all kinds of things were said about him. And, and there was a group of first graders there in Minnesota that did something very interesting. Uh, they set out to encourage uh, Blair Walsh because they knew he had to be down because everybody was, was talking about him and, and, and what happened to him. And, and, and he choked. He, he choked in the biggest minute, uh, biggest time of, of his life there. And so the Minnesota this first graders, they, they encouraged him. And there was a little girl there by the name of Allie Edwards. And she sent a, a note to him. And she said, Blair, I'm really sad. And we want to make you feel better. And then one of her classmates said, dear Blair Walsh, I think you should keep trying. She said, should, S-H-O-O-D. She said, I think you should keep trying. Don't give up. We still love you. Get, G-I-T, get better by practicing. And then there was a, another student there, Tyler Dolphin, and, and he filled a whole page for Walsh. She said, dear Blair, I feel bad for you. Don't give up. You're still number one. Practice, P-R-A-C-T-I-S. Practice more so you can get better at kicking, C-I-C-I-N-G. You're so good at kicking. So don't give up, keep trying, we, we still love you. Well, th this, these kids act of kindness. They, they had no idea what effect it was gonna have on, on Blair Walsh. So what Blair did, he was so touched by these kids that he didn't know that he pushed his flight home. He didn't go home uh, with the Vikings on, on their plane, but he, kicked, he, he stayed behind because he wanted to visit this first grade class and, uh, and, and thank them. And after he visited them there in the classroom, he said it was, a, it was very touching to me that these little kids with all these cards that were very pretty and they were very creative, they weren't bought, they were just made up from the hearts of these kids. And he said, I'm gonna treasure them forever. Well, we, we've all been, I believe at some time in our life where we've been at that point where it seems like our world just fell apart or things just, uh, I mean, they really us, nailed us. And this is what I want us to see tonight when talking about rising up above discouragement. What we see here, that, that discouragement is a part of our life. I mean, it just is. 
it comes uh, often when when uh, when we're doing the right things, uh, but we experience poor results for for whatever reason. Maybe it was our fault. Maybe maybe it was just circumstances. But we're we're working hard. We're we're uh, we don't seem to be progressing. We give it all, and, and and yet in the end we lose. We lose the game, so to speak. Players, uh, you and I, as Christians, we want to cross that finish line, and, and being able to say to the Lord, Lord, I did finish the race. I kept the faith. I left it all on that field down there in America, where you planted me. I left it all there. I didn't have anything else to give it, and so discouragement one of the dangers of discouragement so often it makes us quit it, you know it, it makes us th say things that we shouldn't say and sometimes uh, the things that we say we may not be aware of it but we anger God by some of the things that, that we say to him well Jeremiah was called to speak a very harsh message message to these people and 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 these people were rebellious people they were rebelling against God they were religious people supposedly but they were rebelling against God. And, and on one occasion, Jeremiah was uh, so angry, so angered these people that the assistant high priest there, uh, his name was Pasher. In fact, look at verse uh, one of chapter 20. And, uh, and he says, now Pasher the priest, the son of Immer, who was chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. And then Pasher beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks that were in the upper room. Well, what was what were these things? Well, look back at chapter. Uh, I look back at the end of chapter nineteen, just a few verses above that. Verse fourteen. Then Jeremiah came from Topheth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and he stood in the court of the Lord's house, at, in front of Pasher and all these people that were rebellious. He stood right there in the court. Of the Lord's house, and he said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon this city and upon all of its towns all the disaster that I have pronounced against it, because they have stiffened their neck, refusing to hear my words. And that's when Parsha uh, got a hold of, of Jeremiah and, and just beat him up, beat him severely. And then if you go on down, uh, and in the verse six there, he says, and you, Pasher, this is Jeremiah, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. To Babylon you shall go, and there you shall die, and there you shall be buried, you and all your friends, to whom you have prophesied falsely. Don't miss this. Uh, something very here, important here. Here's a man who walked in obedience to God as a prophet, to do what he told him to do. And he winds up here deep in despair. And, and he's deep in despair. Why? Because he was doing God's will. Now look at verse 7, uh, if, if you will, just a moment. And, and, and this is very, this is where Jeremiah just, uh, he just expresses his displeasure at God over the circumstance. In fact, as we read this, he's even accusing God of deceiving him. Have you ever, have you ever deceived God for, for uh, deceiving you? Uh, but here Jeremiah is, is, is accusing God of deceiving him, and he's uh, accusing God of overpowering him. And, and perhaps he wonders, why, God, you, you called me. You called me to be a prophet. Why didn't you protect me, God? And, and now I'm experiencing suffering and I'm and experiencing mockery from all these people. And so look at verse seven and eight there. He says, oh, Lord, you have deceived me. And I was deceived. You are stronger than I and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock, stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has come, become for me a reproach, a de derision. All along. See what he's saying there? Telling God, you know, I'm preaching, prophesying your word. And everything that I'm saying, I'm, I, I'm, it's receiving violence and receiving destruction. Again, he says, for the word of the Lord, you have become for me a reproach and a derision. Not just once, but all day long. 
But then something interesting happens. Soon his, his complaining, Jeremiah's complaining, moves to praise. Listen to what he said in verse 9. He said, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary without holding it in. I cannot. For I hear my whispering. Terror is on every side. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. Say all my close friends watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived and then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But then look at verse 11. Jeremiah says, but the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed for they, sh they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. See what happens? All this returns from, from distress for, for a few verses there. The, 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 real, the realism of, of the distress that he's going through, it goes to praising God. And so this is what I want to see. And I just want to talk about, give you three points here, uh, ways that, that Jeremiah lived by his feelings, yes, but he also fulfilled God's will for his life. So number one, uh, be honest. Tell God how you feel. That's what he did in, in verse seven there. He said, oh, Lord, you have deceived me and I was deceived. Have you ever been honest with God and just told him? I mean, how you're really feeling. You know, so many times, you know this, I know this. So many times, we say, hey, how you doing, uh, Bill? How you doing, George? And oh, good. Every, everything's fine. I'm doing fine. Everything. But inside, they're experiencing perhaps one of the greatest uh, uh, or largest uh, uh, states of depression or discouragement uh, or, or, or whatever is going on in their life. But yet there's that smile. Well, I'm doing OK. I'm doing good. Everything's fine. Well, Jeremiah was honest, honest, and he felt deceived by God. He felt that that the ridicule that he's experiencing, the offenses that he was experiencing were because of God, because God put him in that situation. And note, Jeremiah had a, an intense lament uh, for God alone. And, and, uh, and that, that, that intense uh, lament for God wasn't made public. And that's important. It wasn't made public between him and God. He got alone somewhere in time with God and, and he just laid it all on God. And, and so I think there's two huge lessons in being honest with God. And telling him how we feel. Number one, God wants us to talk to him. Even when we're angry and we're upset and we're frustrated. Not maybe with him, maybe not with him, but we're frustrated or angry with people or circumstances or whatever. It may be. God wants us to talk to him. He wants us, listen to me, to tell him the truth. To pour out our hearts. You ever... You ever poured out your heart in something? Well, he wants us. God wants us. Our father wants us to pour out our hearts. And he doesn't want us to hold anything back. He, he Why? Why? Well, because he already knows. He knows our feelings. He knows what's in there. And, and he is our father. And Jesus is our shepherd. And the Holy Spirit is our pre present help and our comforter and our wisdom and all those things. So God wants to deal with us and deal with those things. As, as we're dealing with him, you know, so tell the Lord exactly what is in your heart and especially the bad feelings that you have. Tell him about that. In other words, go before God as we're doing tonight and, and not pretending that everything is OK and, and, and that you're someone that you're not. Go before him and hold nothing back as you pray to him, as you you speak with him. So that's the first huge lesson I see in, in being honest with God and how we feel. Jesus wants us to talk to him, no matter what, what our feelings are. Secondly, being honest with God is liberating. When, when I lay it all on God, when I lay all my feelings and frustrations and, and, and lack of uh, receiving answers from me or, or whatever, it, it's just 
liberating when I'm honest with God. I know I've gone into his presence. I know I've, I know I've prayed with him <coughs> or to him. And, and I just know that because of his word, because of his promises, that's liberating. It's freeing to me because I've unloaded. So I've gotten some things off my chest, as we say. I've gotten it off my chest and we get it off our chest. Don't we normally feel better than we were before? And so when we're honest in prayer, we'll feel this deep sense of freedom. It, it, it's just the way the Holy Spirit works. It's what God's intended. And at the same time, we're going to experience this deeper relationship with God. It, it just happens. That's one of the, the purposes and one of the results of prayer when we have this relationship with God. So first of all, Jeremiah was honest and he told God how he felt. There's a second thing that, that, that Jeremiah, in living by his feelings uh, and fulfilling God's will, I think we can learn from this. And that is, we need to be aware and we need to be watchful that the Lord is with us. We need to be aware in these circumstances and we need to be watchful, perhaps to see how the Lord is showing himself in circumstances. Because the Lord says, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And listen to what, what he said in verse 11. But the Lord is with me. <coughs> Excuse me. As a dread warrior, the Lord is with me. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. Whatever has caused your discouragement, God says they're going to fall because I'm over you. I'm watching you. You're, you're in my sight. And Jeremiah realized that he wasn't alone. If you don't realize, if you don't think of anything else in the midst of discouragement or circumstance or trials or tribulation, just remember you're not alone. Never will I leave you. Never will, for, will I forsake you. Now, something very interesting. The Holy Spirit is not going to reveal a verse from Scripture to you in that circumstance if you don't know what that Scripture is. In other words, if it's not in your heart, if we're not reading the Bible, if we're not putting this, this word into our hearts, well, God, the Holy Spirit's not going to reveal a Scripture to us that we're not even aware of is even in the Scripture. And so and that's why it's important to, to, to put the word of God into our hearts for such a time as this. And the Lord says, you know, he, he says the Lord's with me and the Lord is a valiant warrior. He, in fact, he says you're a violent warrior, God. And, and, and so he knew that he was trusting uh, God to win this battle for him. And this is with, between his uh, dejections, if you will. You know, uh, God can deal in, in his own way, in his own time, and he will. Let me rephrase that. God will deal in his own way, in his own time, to deal with our circumstances and to deal with our enemies. If this is coming from a human being, such as Paul was dealing with <coughs> excuse me, the church of Corinth there. Well, God's going to take care of this, and God's going to take care of our enemies, uh, and, and Jeremiah writes this, and he knows it. You know, um, if you get discouraged, look look upward to God. Just, just look up to him. God, I'm hurting. God, I'm angry. God, I don't know what to do next. You know, he is a present tense God. Not past tense, not future tense. He is a present tense God. Always there. Never out. We are never out of his sight. Uh, out, of, out of his his, his power and, and his glory. So envision this mighty arm when you just cry out to him, envision this mighty arm of, of the Lord that's just that he's reaching down and he's just surrounding you. Psalm 91, 4, his feather covered wings come around you and they hold you as you, as you have sought refuge in him. And just envision uh, his presence and, and what that's going to do, his presence when you feel those mighty arms coming around you. And you're seeing this in circumstances that God is, is revealing to you, that he does have you. He is in charge. You know, it's going to provide courage to you. It's going to provide strength, uh, maybe to take another step, maybe to, uh, to walk another day. It's going to 
it, it's going to give you tenacity to, to stay strong and to persevere. Man, we need that today. We need tenacity and we need to be able to persevere. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if you watched the, uh, I watched as little of it as, as I could, uh, of the, uh, our president's uh, State of the Union last night. But one of the things that, 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 that it just dawns on me, well, it doesn't, let me rephrase it, it doesn't dawn on me, it's just more and more of a, um, of, of a firm belief that, that I'm beginning to, to believe and to formulate, if you will, in looking around at the circumstances, not, not just my circumstance, but as I said, looking around at the circumstances of the world, and, and particularly here in, in, in our nation today, there's, there's two types of wrath of God. One is, a, is a, uh, a, an over, a physical wrath. In other words, uh, like the nation, like, like Sodom and Gomorrah, as, as an example. Uh, he, he saw what was going on. He, he told Abraham what was going to happen. And then he brought the hammer down. He physically brought his wrath down and destroyed Sodom and, and destroyed Gomorrah. Well, perhaps what we are experiencing today is, is that other kind of wrath of God. And it's that passive wrath. And we can read about passive wrath if you want to read about it in Romans, especially Romans chapter one. Paul uh, writes about this to the church of Rome, <coughs> this passive, passive wrath in which God says, OK. You don't want me, I'm going to push you into your unbelief. In other words, I'm going to push you into your circumstances. And my wrath is going to come down to you through circumstances that you are experiencing. Can be for an individual, if, if you read all that. <clears throat> he says that several times. And, and it can be as, as it has been in the past for nations. And so this is one of the important things, I believe, of why we really need to keep our focus on God today. Because we are in the end times and God's not playing around. He has never played around with the nation of Israel or with other nations. He is not playing around with what America is doing uh, to his name, to his glory, and, and to this creation that, that he created and blessed. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, the instant cure of most of our religious life, the instant cure of most of our religious ills, would be to become suddenly aware that we are in God. Listen to what he's saying. The instant cure of most of our religious ills, our discouragements, all those things, would be to become suddenly aware that we are in God. When's the last time you thought, I am in God? Jesus, Paul says, in Christ, I'm in Christ and Christ is in, in, in me. But, but think about that, suddenly aware that we are in God and God is inside of us. Well, he is. We know we have the Holy Spirit. And Tozer says this would lift us out of our pit of narrowness and cause our hearts to be enlarged. In other words, living God's presence enabled us to, to fight on despite our, our discouragement. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the Lord's army today, we cannot, we cannot do anything but stay strong in the Lord and continue to stand on the word of God. We're not doing it just for ourselves, as we know. We're doing it for those who will come after us. And we're doing it for the kingdom of God, to bring others in this fight into the kingdom of God and the salvation and the forgiveness of sin that, that, that we so enjoy. And then there's a third uh, there's a, a third uh, lesson here, I think, that we can get from, uh, from, from Jeremiah, being honest and with God and how we feel, being aware that, that God is around us and God is, is watchful. And, and that means be aware, think about it, think about the Lord, that he is watching us. Nowhere we can go that his eye is not on us. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know his eye is on me. Well, the third lesson is to be worshipful. Praise God with your whole heart. 
And that doesn't just happen like that. Well, I'm going to praise God with my whole heart right now. Well, you can. And, and, and it's wonderful to do that. But to be worshipful. Worship is part of praise. And to praise God with our whole heart, just like if you want to learn to, to, to walk a mile or, or uh, run a mile or whatever, you got to do it. You've got to train yourself to do it. We've got to train ourselves to worship God with our praises. Um, praise is the one weapon. Listen to me. Praise is the one weapon in the Christian's arsenal, in your arsenal and in my arsenal, where Satan has no defense. He's got no defense when we are praising God. He may have a defense. When we're telling him about our discouragement, we're telling him about our, 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 our illness, the things that we need. You know, he may, he may be able to put into our minds, well, God doesn't really hear you. God's not going to answer that. You're sick. You're done. You know, you're, you're toast. But when we praise God, Satan has no weapon in his arsenal to defeat that. And so praise when, when, when things aren't going our way. Praising when things are not going our way. And, and I just want to tell you, I believe this with all my heart. When we are, when things are not going our way, just like they weren't going the way for Jeremiah, nor, nor ever did as he was a prophet, really, except he was fulfilling the call of God. When things aren't going our way and instead, or in addition to crying out to God, woe is me. When we praise God, praise him that he knows, praise him that I know you're with me. Praise you, God, that I don't see it, but I know you know the light at the end of this valley. Uh, you know, and when we praise him, I just happen to believe with all of my heart that that praise is more precious to God than our lifting our needs and our wants and our desires up to him. When he sees someone that, and remember, the circumstance that you and I are in came through the hands of God and through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. And so when we're praising God, it means we're faithful. It means we're trusting him. And when we praise him, it just, that has to be precious to God. We don't have any problem most of the time praising God when things go well, when a prayer is answered, we say, oh, praise God. He answered our prayer. But praise is the weapon that we have. And, and, and that's because when we praise God, he releases that power. He releases his power when we praise him. Uh, he releases more of God's power than any other form of, of petition that we can give him. When we are praising him, listen to me again. When we praise him in the midst of our circumstances, no matter whether they're good or, or they're bad or or, or they've got us on our faces or on our knees, praise uh, it, it unleashes more power, more presence, if you will, uh, presence of God reaching that fruition that we know that he's there with us and any other petition that we can lift up to him. Psalm 22, verse 3 said, and, and this is a praise. In fact, I'm just going to turn it up real quick here. Psalm 22, verse 3. And in fact, let me read beginning in verse one uh, of Psalm 22, because I want you to see it kind of goes along with the way Jeremiah was feeling. <clears throat> and the psalmist, David says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer and by night but I find no rest. Doesn't that sound a lot like the same kind of context that Jeremiah is in? And David is doing the same thing, perhaps a little less harsh language, but he's doing the very same thing that, that Nehemiah did. And then listen to verse three. This is the praise in the midst of David's problems. Yet you are holy, enthroned on what? Enthroned on what? On the praises of God. Oh, I encourage you, if you haven't turned there tonight before you go to bed, take a look at Psalm 22, verse 3, and praise God for your day. Praise God no matter how you feel. And underline that. You are holy, 
enthroned on the praises. Means he's sitting on those praises, he's living on those praises. He he uh, relishes those praises, and that's what God wants to be. He wants to be praised. He wants to be glorified. Enthroned on the praises of Israel. You know. Uh, Now you may understand, <coughs> and, and I understand why I say, because I include myself in this category. Now you may understand why you hear me so often say, we don't praise God enough. And he praises tonight, silence. We don't praise God enough. Why is that so important? Not because God's waiting to be praised, but God releases his power. He says, I live on those praises. I'm in those praises because I am in you and you are in me. And so maybe a lesson, the fourth lesson tonight is, let's truly do whatever it needs to be done so that we individually in our lives praise God for, for who we are, for who he is, for where he has placed us. Praise God when he's using you as he's doing Jeremiah and he's using all of every one of you that are on this, this prayer t uh, meeting tonight. God is using you. If you don't know how he's using you, just, just ask me. Talk to me. I'll tell you how he's using you. And, and many of you he's using in a way that you cannot even imagine the impact that you're having on other people's lives. So let's learn uh, to rise above our discouragement and, and let's really truly learn and not just learn but to praise God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and watch what God will do. Would you pray with me tonight? Oh Lord our Heavenly Father God we love you. God we praise you. God we we have here at Pine Drive encouragers they are encouragers you use their hands or feet or voice or hearts to touch so many people and yet we're just like jeremiah just like david when we're, we're doing what you called us to do we know satan doesn't like that and satan will attack because spiritual warfare is real and it's very very easy very easy to be discouraged today because we see things, we hear things, we learn things that are just quite discouraging, even cause fear and consternation, if you will, for, for our children, for our grandchildren, for those who will follow us when, when we come home to be with you there in heaven. Father, we are a nation that is so out of control. Father, it's going faster in immorality than Sodom and Gomorrah ever thought about going. And yes, I understand technology, Lord. But Father, I, I pray you would stop it. I pray, Father God, that you would give us that encouragement and, and help us to understand in the midst of a battle where that battle is coming from. It's not coming from another person is coming through Christ, through Satan, using other people as his tool to bring discouragement, to, to, to bring uh, discredit upon our beliefs. And, and so, Lord, I just thank you for your words. You've given us your words. You've given us the Holy Spirit and almighty power of God to live in us. And we praise you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen.